Hello everyone, welcome back to this thing where you look at my face while I say stuff. Um, and today I wanted to revisit the theory of the bicameral mind um, because it's a theory that every time I revisit it, I still find it immensely profound. Um, I find it very convincing, in fact. Um, although you know there are counter arguments to the theory, um, which are well described, um, that a lot of people like to bring up to me. Um, but I think that, you know, some modification of the original theory can kind of, you know, account for these seeming paradoxes and seeming contradictions. And I can discuss some of those in this video as well. But what I wanted to do is kind of give an overview of the theory once again and explain what I think is so profound about it and why I think that it makes perfect sense and why it fits into history so well. So if you don't know, this is based on a book written by Julian Jaynes um, titled The Origins of Consciousness in the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind. So the book is actually about two things, the origins of consciousness and the bicameral mind. And depending on your perspective, it's either a work of unprecedented genius or the ramblings of a madman. But to be honest, those aren't necessarily mutually exclusive categories. Genius very often accompanies madness, or madness accompanies genius. In any case, I want to discuss why I think this theory is so profound. Because a kind of preface to the book is the origins of consciousness. Consciousness is the mentality which characterizes humans um, and distinguishes us from animals. And you may be thinking like, well, aren't animals obviously conscious? Um, and yes, they are. But by consciousness, we mean specifically something like conscious awareness. Um, even more specifically, we could say that humans are characterized by a mentality which we can call ego consciousness. By ego consciousness, I mean that we produce this sense of self and then we kind of play the role of ourselves in the story of our lives. It's like we're playing a character almost. And your ego is the thing that kind of constructs a narrative around your life. And, and it's the part of your brain that's always kind of uh, fitting your life into the narrative of you know the events of your life. So for example, if you're a doctor, um, your ego and what you're attending to will be relevant to kind of playing the role of a doctor. And so most people today have an ego. And in fact, it's, it's so common that nobody really thinks about the fact that they have an ego. You just have one and you just kind of assume that this is the normal way to think. But what this book posits is the possibility that other mentalities exist that aren't like this, that are extremely unlike this, and that humans in the past may have had such a mentality. And in fact, there are humans today, people today, who still have remnants of this mentality. In fact, you know, everybody should have remnants of this mentality if it existed in the past. What we have to realize is that consciousness is actually a very small proportion of our mental lives. It tends to be over magnified um, and the average person tends to think of their consciousness as being the extent of their minds. But in reality, a huge percentage of your mental functioning is actually unconscious, below the threshold of consciousness. The best example I can think of is something like driving, where when you're driving and you're good at it, you've practiced driving for a while, it's not something you necessarily do consciously. You're actually kind of just relying on your muscle memory, i.e. your unconscious psyche, whereas your consciousness is usually thinking about something else. Playing an instrument is a good example. Doing any kind of skill at a high level, for example, typing. You most like, like, like I said, most of what you do is unconscious. Think about like, for instance, uh, reaching for your phone or like opening up a new, a new tab on your computer. And so this suggests the possibility that in the past, humans didn't have egos. Because again, most of your mental functioning goes on without an ego. Now we shouldn't confuse this with the idea that the ego is completely useless and just kind of like an observer, like in a passive observer. It clearly does do things. Um, and in fact, it's what makes humans so different from animals and what allows us to kind of direct our minds in a very specific way. Um, and, and you know, construe these narratives around our lives, which allow us to go um, in an unforeseen direction. We aren't just, you know, bound to our instincts. We can actually take civilization very far and do things which aren't just a product of our genetic makeup. But one of the reasons that Jane's posits the the possibility that humans in the past didn't have egos the way we do um, comes directly from the Iliad. The Iliad is this famous Greek poem, which pertains to this ancient war, which probably did happen. There is a good archaeological evidence that uh, the, the book itself is based on true events, even though like it's it's hard to say that, you know, this specific individual like character interactions actually happened. But um, it's clear that this is history. But what's really interesting about the characters in the Iliad is that they don't seem to have their own egos. They don't ever like confer to themselves and plan out what to do. Any time a decision needs to be made, something else happens. Let's take a look at a passage that happens right at the beginning, right when Achilles is contemplating murdering Agamemnon. The son of Peleus was furious, that's Achilles, and his heart within his shaggy breast was divided, whether to draw his sword, push the others aside, and kill the son of Atreus, that's Agamemnon, or to restrain himself and check his anger. While he was thus in two minds, and was drawing his mighty sword from its scabbard, Minerva came down from heaven, 
For Juno had sent her, in the love she bore to them both, and seized the son of Peleus by his yellow hair, visible to him alone. For of the others no man could see her. Achilles turned in amaze, and by the fire that flashed from her eyes, at once knew that she was Minerva. Why are you here, said he, daughter of Aegis bearing Jove, to see the pride of Agamemnon, son of Atreus? Let me tell you, and it shall surely be, he shall pay for his insolence with his life. And Minerva said, I come from heaven, if you will hear me, to bid you stay your anger. Juno has sent me, who cares for both of you alike. Cease then, this brawling, and do not draw your swords. Rail at him if you will, and your railing will not be in vain. For I tell you, and it shall surely be, that you shall hereafter receive gifts three times as splendid by reason of this present insult. Hold therefore, and obey. Goddess, answered Achilles. However angry a man may be, he must do as you two command him. This will be best, for the gods ever hear the prayers of him who has obeyed them. So the language here is really interesting. And in fact, this being such an old work, work of literature, it's hard to translate it with perfect accuracy. And we have a tendency to kind of project our own minds into these characters um, and think of them as being relatively similar to us. But is anything about this similar to how most people experience things? I mean, does a god ever just come down from heaven and tell you to stop contemplating a murder? And this word specifically about him being in two minds, it may sound like consciousness because, you know, to have your own mind and to be in kind of a divided state, it sounds like he has a conscious mentality and is conferring with himself. But that's actually not what's going on. What's happening is that he's conflicted between two behaviors, either to murder Agamemnon or to, you know, not murder him. And in this decision stress, when he's conflicted about these two actions, a god comes down from heaven and is like, maybe you shouldn't murder the king. And his answer isn't like, uh, you know, that's good advice, I guess you should follow you. It's more like, every fiber of my being is telling me to murder this man, but since a god commanded me to do otherwise, I shall not. Now, you might be thinking, what's the significance of this? And the significance is, if we think back to early humans and ancient humans, it would seem to require a high degree of inventiveness to come up with like a concept like this. It is very creative and very poetic. And the question is, what are these gods? What are the gods in these stories? Are they just kind of like a poetic device that the authors injected into the story to tell us something about the way, you know, fate seems to rule our lives? Possibly, it could be like, you know, a metaphor. But what Julian Jaynes proposes is that this is actually not what's going on. What's going on is that the reason a god intervenes and makes the decision for Achilles is because this is how ancient humans experience their own minds. They didn't have egos the way we do. They didn't command themselves. Instead, they were commanded by gods. What were these gods? These gods were actually hallucinations arising from their own minds. I.e., whenever there was a decision stress and you couldn't just rely on your instincts, you would hear a voice coming from your own mind that, from your perspective, would appear to be this external god, and this god would tell you what to do. And this is exactly how it is in the story. All of the characters are just like kind of like these puppets to the gods. The whole story is about gods just kind of like playing people as if it's a game of chess. So the idea is before we could exert control over ourselves using our egos, we were controlled by these hallucinatory voices, which from our perspectives appear to be like these supernatural entities. And if this seems far-fetched, I would argue that the reason it seems so implausible is because with our present mentalities and our ego consciousness, we tend to kind of project that mentality back into the past and imagine that uh, people in the past would have been more similar to us. But there's good evidence to think that in reality, people experienced gods very vividly and very, you know, tangibly. And I guess the thing that draws me to this theory so much is that it readily accounts for the existence of gods. Because it's kind of a weird thing, you know, the way, the way I used to put it into perspective is imagine like you were an explorer and you were in Africa and like you just came across a bunch of chimpanzees worshipping a statue. If you knew anything about animal behavior, you would think right away that that's some weird shit. And yet it happened. It happened on this planet that at some point in history, a bunch of monkey men started worshipping things that they couldn't actually see. So it readily accounts for the origins of religion, and it also accounts for the fact that it's very ubiquitous that gods existed in early civilizations. And in fact, in all of them, in all early civilizations, we see that there's this kind of bowing down to these higher authority figures who don't actually exist, who perhaps exist in the imagination, but what we're positing is that they existed in hallucinations. And these hallucinations were a mechanism for allowing civilization to grow and to flourish um, and, to, and to kind of expand group sizes beyond the typical 40 
individuals that you would see in hunter-gatherer groups. In other words, the gods were vital for the origins of civilization. There's a lot of intricacies to this theory, including the fact that, um, you know, the, the thing that activates the god speaking would be distress. So in the case, in the example that we just saw, the, there was a decision stress um, because he was conflicted about the two behaviors. It's in this moment that the god intervenes and chooses one of the paths. And that's actually how the ego by itself operates. The ego kind of acts as this mediator whenever we feel our psyche pulling in one direction, but our mind or conscious pulling in another. The ego mediates between those two drives. And it's also very clear that religion or, you know, uh, the belief in gods is very vital for the origins of civilization. Because the earliest construction projects that our species partook in, um, it turns out that many of them are religious or spiritual in nature. They aren't like living spaces as you might like expect, but rather they're religious spaces. It seems that the idea of gods and the idea of the supernatural is what put us on the path to civilization. We first built things like temples, like for example, the one at Quebec Tepe, um, and then we decided to become more sedentary. And this makes a lot of sense because something like civilization seems to depend on a higher cognitive capacity. And that higher cognitive capacity may have been supplied in the form of hallucinations. Our species went further because of our ability to hallucinate. And that might sound weird, but if you think about it, your own ego consciousness is kind of like a hallucination. It's a voice you hear in your head telling you what to do. So modern humans hallucinate all the time. It's just that because everybody does it, we don't think there's anything weird about it. We only think hallucinations are weird if they're not ego consciousness hallucinations. But again, the evidence for this idea is overwhelming. It doesn't just come from the Iliad and the weirdness of the characters in the Iliad. It comes from various historical documents that clearly show that early city-states were ruled by gods. And you might be thinking, what does that mean? What does it mean for a city to be ruled by a god? Take the ancient Sumerian city Ur, for example. The city's original name is something like the abode of Inanna. Inanna was a moon god um, in Mesopotamia, and the city was considered his realm. It was his property. He, he was the owner of that city, and everybody in the city were his subjects. How does that make sense unless we posit the possibility that the gods were interacting with people through hallucinations? They weren't, you know, they were, there were no literal gods. Instead, the god was actually a part of the nervous system of every person. And psychologically speaking, the idea of a god has immense psychological utility, um, and there's a psychological mechanism which allows something like a god to exert considerable control over people's behavior and allow them to cooperate on an unprecedented scale. This is because of the fact that humans, just like all other social animals, are subject to the principle of dominance. In every group, there are individuals who are higher in the dominance hierarchy and the individuals who are lower in the hi dominance hierarchy. And those who are the highest in the dominance hierarchy are able to control the actions of the group because they're ultimately like the prime decision makers. They tell the group where to go, when to eat, when to hunt, when to, you know, get water. And so this functions for just normal hunter-gatherer bands. There's not really a problem because they're usually less than 40 individuals. And so a single individual can exert his control over that many people. And think about it like this. Every time you interact with a person who's higher on the dominance hierarchy than you, you're kind of submissive to them. You have to obey their authority. Now think about what would happen if we could imagine a higher entity. If we can imagine a person who, again, doesn't actually exist, but could exert their influence over us. And we perceive this individual to be higher in the dominance hierarchy. In fact, so high in the dominance hierarchy that they exist in heaven. That is what a god fundamentally is. A god is in a supreme position relative to other humans, and so other humans are, com are compelled to obey these gods. You can think about the perspective of a bicameral man. No matter where he went, his god would be with him. Because again, that god isn't actually a god, it's part of his nervous system. It's a part of his own psyche which can exert control over him. It would give him hallucinations and he would have to obey those hallucinations. And again, this is how human civilizations were able to grow beyond the, the kind of, uh, you know, small hunter-gatherer bands that we existed for for hundreds of thousands of years prior. And I guess one of the finer details about this theory that I really like, and something that I guess is kind of hard to articulate, is the fact that this schema is a lot more cognitively simple. It makes better sense of the transition from animals to humans. Because you can think way back in the past, um, something like hallucinations just, you know, speaking to you and telling you what to do is like, in a sense, cognitively simpler than having an ego that has to, you know, command itself. It's like the gods tamed humanity. The, in fact, humans were domesticated by the gods, by these higher imaginary entities. And the origins of something like the bicameral mind is quite 
complicated. It isn't just like we suddenly started living in temples. It was probably a lot simpler in the very early days of civilization and became more sophisticated throughout time. But again, this is what allowed a group to grow immensely large because it wasn't a person who ruled the group, it was a god. And here's another very subtle thing about this theory that is very appealing to me because I'm very interested in the process of individuation where we as individual egos begin to kind of differentiate from our groups and go our separate ways. But you can imagine like in the very early days of humanity, there wasn't much of a different differentiation between individual people. People were more or less the same, um, and the kind of group acted as a cohesive unit um, as though it had a single mind. But it seems that like the process of individuation started when we imagined these higher beings, and these higher beings were almost like fully fledged egos. The gods in the Iliad are much better developed characters than the human characters, to an extent. But I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that in early civilizations, it seems that the gods were more like real characters, whereas the people were just kind of like their subjects and not really autonomous. It's like the gods individuated before we did. And by imitating these gods and emulating them, because that's another kind of function of the gods, they were kind of like these higher beings who you ought to emulate. By emulating these higher beings who are more fully fledged characters, we became more individuated. It's like I said before, the ego is kind of like a character playing, you know, a role in the story of your life. Well, these gods are also like these characters, but again, they're not egos. They're they're the thing that controls the psyche before there is an ego. And throughout various civilizations, ancient civilizations, we see evidence for this kind of mentality. We see evidence of people speaking to the gods, of consulting statues and asking the gods, what do you want us to do? The Code of Hammurabi is my favorite example because it's the most concrete. The Code of Hammurabi, if you don't know, is this ancient law code um, that was produced by the king Hammurabi, um, and it stipulates things like, you know, um, some of them are quite funny um, and quite barbaric by today's standards, but they're, you know, they're law codes and, and they exist for a reason, for a civilization to function, um, for, for things to be fair, seemingly fair. And even though the law code is attributed to Hammurabi, Hammurabi would have told you that the code came from Shamash. Shamash was Hammurabi's god, and, and Hammurabi thought of himself as a subject of Shamash. And Hammurabi claimed that Shamash told him the code. In other words, what we believe happened is that he experienced hallucinations from his god Shamash, and he more or less just wrote them down. Now let's think about this from a psychological perspective, because in a way, it's it's like he's using a statue. Imagine like Hammurabi speaking to a statue. He's using a statue to access higher cognitive functions, which again come from the unconscious mind. In analytical psychology, the unconscious mind is extremely intelligent and it possesses a remarkable intelligence and in fact can give us higher wisdom. And so in essence, communicating with these statues and kind of trying to get your gods to speak to you is a way to access the higher information in your brain. And this was back in a time when people didn't have the concept of neurology or, you know, psychology. And so from their perspective, the gods were literally speaking to them. This perfectly accounts for the fact that in the past we were obsessed with gods and it, it accounts for the fact that gods exist in the first place. Because that is a weird thing. That is a weird thing that we believe in gods and that gods were such an important aspect of early human civilizations. It's easy to think of today and and think that gods aren't like a, you know, a, a, a huge part of the average person's life. You know, it's maybe something that you just do on Sundays. But in the past, gods were like the center of society. Literally, because usually the uh, usually city-states were constructed around a temple. The temple was like the main building. And it was like kind of like the locus of control where the gods' presence could be felt by other people. And it also explains why people were more willing to believe in gods. It wasn't something that you had to have faith in because it would occur through hallucinations. From your perspective, the idea of gods is extremely obvious. There's no denying it because obviously you experience these gods and you hear their voices. It's easy to deny something like that today and just call a person crazy. But back then, that wouldn't have been the case. And that's why I say that it's cognitively simpler for something like the bicameral mind to precede consciousness. And so law codes that came from gods, from these higher entities that exist in our psyches, um, such as the Code of Hammurabi or even like the Ten Commandments, because the Ten Commandments also came from God, these are prescriptions for how humans ought to behave. And because they come from this higher authority, you're compelled to obey them. The same reason that you're compelled to obey your boss. Because your boss is higher up in the dominance hierarchy, and so you kind of just have to do what they tell you. In the same way, these gods who develop these, you know, rigid morals and rigid laws for society, because they're kind of like over your shoulder all the time, they're forcing you to kind of obey these rules. And by obeying these rules, society is able to grow. That's kind of a key ingredient in society, these rigid moral laws that you have to follow. And it's what allows a society to go beyond its animal instincts. And, you know, it eventually led to what we are today, these higher moral beings. And a very important line of evidence that I've neglected to speak about thus far is the fact that people today also experience auditory hallucinations. 
Many people with schizophrenia experience them. Not all people with schizophrenia, because schizophrenia is actually a kind of a complicated disease, um, and it has various, you know, um, um, uh, presentations. But many people with this disease do experience voices, and they hear these voices out audibly and loudly, and they ha often have a very commanding presence. And in fact, when they occur, they almost like dissolve the ego. So people who experience loud auditory hallucinations, it's like their ego momentarily disappears. And this is probably what it was like to be a bicameral man. Not only that, but it's actually possible to induce these hallucinations through electrical stimulation or in, and other techniques, in fact. In fact, just the other night, I heard a loud booming voice while I was dreaming. And that's another thing. Remember the fact that I said that these voices are basically expressions of the unconscious mind? It seems that the unconscious mind still speaks to us. We still encounter these autonomous entities arising from our dreams. So when you're in a dream and you see these other beings, they're coming from your own mind, but they kind of present themselves as these external forces. So in a sense, that could be what the gods have been replaced by. And that's on top of the fact that many people experience gods and, you know, uh, things like Jesus in their dreams. These can be also kind of um, expressions of that earlier bicameral mentality, but rather than um, occurring while we're awake, they seem to occur while we're asleep. And so that's why I say that this theory is very consistent with analytical psychology. And again, literary sources are ubiquitous about gods. They appear in like every mythology and every early story. Um, and, and if you read um, ancient Sumerian texts, you see all the time the gods commanding people what to do. People just say that the reason they do things is because the gods commanded it. And there are many legends about the gods being the ones who gifted humanity with, uh, you know, various gifts of humanity, such as language and agriculture. And even a story like the story of Adam and Eve, where people are clearly in communication with a god, it seems to show a kind of bicameral mentality. But remember, this is a book that's called The Origins of Consciousness in the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind. So what's the origins of consciousness? Well, it's complicated, and in fact, it's it's still rather unclear to say, but clearly we're conscious today. So if there was a mentality like the bicameral mind, it definitely transitioned into consciousness. And that, and that transition may not have been um, discreet. It may have been very slow. And in fact, there's evidence for this. There's evidence for the fact that in some civilizations, people needed to do more specific things in order to get the gods to talk to them. But slowly over time, you know, I'm suspicious that the development of language is actually what kind of um, allowed for the ego mentality. But it could have been other things, such as just natural selection, um, or the fact that civilization became so complicated that the, something like the bicameral mind was just no longer feasible. But of course, we didn't just give up on gods because they were such a vital part of our civilizations beforehand that they remain today as a kind of remnant of that earlier mentality. And I forgot to explain the bicameral part, <laughs> um, which is um, the fact that these hallucinations would have probably come from the right hemisphere of the brain. Um, and so the right hemisphere was almost like this god mentality, while the left hemisphere was like the man mentality. And it's super interesting because each person would have been simultaneously a god while also being this passive man. Because again, the god is a part of the man's mentality. Even though it seems from his perspective to be this external voice coming from heaven, in reality, it was coming from his own mind, the deeper parts of his own psyche. It expressed an intelligence which arose therefrom. And you know, there's a lot of evidence today that suggests that something like this must have been happening. Think about shamanism. The, the phenomenon of shamanism is um, societies that are shamanistic, they essentially engage in these ritual practices in order to communicate with their ancestral spirits or to communicate with their gods. And there are a lot of shamanistic practices such as like rhythmic dancing or um, taking psychedelics, also known as entheogens. Entheogens is like, um, like a spiritual term for psychedelics. Regardless, it's a way to produce these hallucinations so that they can speak with God and confer with God and, and find out what to do based on that conversation with God. But of course, from our psychological perspective, what's actually happening is that they're communicating with the higher parts of their mind. They're communicating with the unconscious mind, which again, can exert a high degree of intelligence. And by kind of utilizing their entire psyches, they're able to get more information than just by kind of like relying on your ego consciousness. Because the ego is very, you know, it's very self-referential. Um, and so it's difficult for the ego to kind of escape and find new ideas. But talking to the gods, aka talking with your own unconscious mind, um, is a way to kind of derive higher insights that aren't obvious to your ego. Apologies for Teddy barking. And there's so much I haven't even discussed. For example, the bicameral civilizations of Egypt or of Mesopotamia. Um, I've made videos for these in the past. Um, they might be a little bit dated. So let me know if you wanted me to remake those. Um, and I can make them really cool because I really love like digging into archeology span and ancient civilizations and just seeing and just seeing their, their mentality and their lives. Because this was a, a period of history where um, the, the kind of separation of church and state didn't exist. The church was the state. Everything functioned through religion. F society was fundamentally religious. And of course, 
realized that it, that makes sense that we were so religious in the past and why you know we don't necessarily need religion today because the gods don't speak to us or to put it another way we kind of are conscious of the concept of psychology um and so we can make sense of experiences like that um but think about back then way back then um when we didn't have psychology and we weren't as intelligent to come up with the idea of psychology Something like the bicameral mind would have been a very advantageous mentality because it's a higher part of your mind that controls your behavior, um, but it is a form of social control. And I think that makes sense. I think that's intuitively correct, that religion is a kind of form of social control. And that social control is what allowed civilization to grow beyond the confines of what is typical given our genetics. And again, is this really that different from your own mentality? Because you also hear a voice. And that voice comes from your own mind and you kind of just do what this voice tells you to do. But the difference is you identify with this voice. You think of yourself as the voice. Whereas back then they also heard a voice, but they didn't think of it as themselves. They thought of it as a God speaking to them. So it's not super different from just having an internal monologue. It, the, the difference would be that your internal monologue is relatively quiet and it sounds internal. Whereas these bicameral voices would have sounded very loud and commanding. But it's just so fascinating to think about the individuation of humankind. You know, the, the characters in the Iliad, they slowly start to become conscious towards the end of the book, which itself deserves a video because it's a very fascinating topic. But I guess the point I'm trying to make is that we became godlike by believing in gods. Slowly, we began to wrestle with the gods and kind of gain our own autonomy. We were no longer commanded by these spiritual higher individuals um, you know, that lived in temples, but we began to command ourselves. So we began to individuate, but the path to individuation started by being in this kind of enslaved state um, of being controlled by these higher entities. But of course, that's actually a necessary step in the evolution of, you know, of the autonomous psyche um, and in the process of individuation, because um, before this, we weren't, you know, we weren't individuals at all. We were just kind of like these beings that had no egos um, and couldn't think for ourselves. We more or less just kind of did what our instincts told us to do um, and did what, um, you know, the, the, the dominant individual in our groups wanted us to do. So even though it seems like by believing in a god and by having a bicameral mind, you would have been enslaved, in actuality, you would have been more free because again, this god came from your own mind. So in a sense, you were just commanding yourself. And I guess like the one thing I want to emphasize before I go um, is the fact that Again, this god, because it's higher than you and because you perceive it as being higher in the dominance hierarchy, would control your behavior. And so um, I, I guess the point I'm trying to really hammer home is that the gods domesticated human beings. They tamed us the same way you kind of tame your dog or, you know, t teach your dog how to do tricks. The gods taught us how to be civilized. But anyways, yeah, I'm done rambling. Uh, thank you for listening. I hope that was compelling and interesting. Um, if you want me to make future bicameral mind videos on specific topics, always just just please let me know and I'll, I'll definitely get on that. It's a very fascinating topic. I'm enamored with this theory. Um, I think it's fully consistent with analytical psychology and I think it deserves a lot more attention. But anyways, thanks for watching. Um, if you are interested in supporting me on Patreon, that would be super awesome. I would appreciate you and I would love you forever. Um, that, and you would also get access, access to our Discord channel where you can talk to me and have discussions and have a good time. Anyways, uh, thanks for watching. Have a good day and may good luck always come your way.